Tonight, Russia's dangerous threats, talk of World War III, the stunning warning from the Russian foreign minister saying nuclear war is not off the table after the U.S. agreed to send more military aid to Ukraine. This as Russia ramps up its attack on the east, evidence of a third mass grave uncovered in Mariupol. Our team on the ground in Ukraine again tonight. Also breaking tonight, Amazon's deadly failure, the shocking new report after six people were killed in an Amazon warehouse in December as a massive tornado tore through the building. Investigators finding all of the employees who died were sheltering in the wrong part of the facility. Tonight, the federal agency calling on Amazon to do better. Little League shooting scare, the shocking moment at a kid's baseball game in North Carolina. Gunshots ringing out in the middle of an inning. Players running for cover, others dropping to the ground. The pitcher's mother telling top story about the horrifying ordeal. Inside the rollover, the disturbing crash caught on camera. Students sent flying, hitting the ceiling of the bus after a Mustang rammed into its side. What the driver says he saw moments before impact. Plus, kidnapping update, the three-month-old taken from his apartment, kidnapped as his grandmother unloaded groceries. Tonight, news on that baby's condition and the multiple suspects now in custody. And Bitcoin 401k? Fidelity becoming the first major retirement plan to let investors stash away the cryptocurrency. What you need to know to make sure your nest egg stays safe. Top story starts right now. And good evening. Tonight, the world holding its breath as Russia takes its most aggressive stance yet towards the West. The Russian foreign minister warning the risk of World War III is real and that the possibility of nuclear conflict should be, quote, not be underestimated. The stark message coming after the U.S. secretaries of state and defense visited Kyiv vowing to send more military aid. Russia accusing the U.S. and NATO of fighting a proxy war with Russia by continuing to supply weapons to Ukraine. Those weapons, the U.S. says, needed to fight back in the areas of eastern Ukraine, the latest target of Russian aggression. The city of Mariupol nearly entirely in ruins. Residents there, you see them, forced to bury bodies in exchange for food and water. Putin's army closing in another key city in the east as the threat of a full-scale Russian takeover in that region looms large. Kelly Kobier is on the ground in the war zone again tonight and leads us off. Tonight, Ukrainian troops trying to hold the line in the east, now facing an intensifying Russian assault. In Mariupol, authorities say Russian forces have hit a steel plant 35 times in 24 hours. It's the last holdout of Ukrainian troops there. The city's mayor says a third mass grave has been discovered and that locals are being forced to bury bodies in exchange for food and water. And tonight, Russia is taking new actions outside Ukraine, now cutting off natural gas deliveries to Poland after Poland refused Russia's demand to pay in rubles. Poland, like much of Europe, is still buying Russian oil and gas and has been sending Ukraine weapons. Today in Germany, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin meeting with defense officials from 40 countries, pushing for more military support for Ukraine. Ukraine clearly believes that it can win. And so does everyone here. And U.S. officials now tell NBC News that American intelligence sharing at the beginning of the Russian invasion helped Ukraine move its aircraft and air defenses out of harm's way. All of it comes after those stunning comments from Russia's foreign minister overnight, saying the U.S. and NATO are fighting a proxy war, warning the risk of World War III is real. I don't want it to be blown out of proportion, he said, but it should not be underestimated. Ukraine's foreign minister responding, this only means Moscow senses defeat. But in the east, fears Russia is tightening its grip. In Kherson, where locals resisted the Russian occupation weeks ago, signs of a complete takeover. President Zelensky accusing the Russians of laying the groundwork for a sham referendum to declare Kherson's independence, calling it shameful. In Kyiv, the anger for Russia now so deep, a statue meant to mark the bond between Russia and Ukraine now being brought to the ground. The Biden administration said they're now moving these weapons into Ukraine much faster. Secretary of State Blinken saying that from the time they get the green light, it now takes about 72 hours to get weapons into Ukraine. It used to take weeks. Tom? Okay, that pipeline is definitely 
going a little faster. Kelly, thank you for that. We want to thank Kelly for that, and we want to bring in Angela Stent. She's a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and the author of Putin's World, Russia's War Against the West and with the Rest. Angela, I want to start with that warning from Russia's top diplomats that we just heard there in Kelly's story. Is this another empty threat, and at what point does the West need to take this seriously? Well, the Russians have made threats like this before. They're obviously very angry uh, that Defense Secretary Austin and Secretary of State Blinken visited Kiev, and they're angry that the U.S. and others are providing the Ukrainians with heavier weapons. Um, but I think we shouldn't get too excited about this. Uh, Mr. Lavrov, in the end, said, well, the danger of World War III was there, but, you know, it wouldn't necessarily happen. Think about this realistically. If Russia were to detonate a tactical nuclear weapon in that area, how would that help Russia's goals? It's trying to take territory in Ukraine, and what it would get would be nuclear fallout both in Ukraine and in Russia as well. So it, this is much more of a scare tactic. And it's they're trying to deter the West uh, from supplying Ukraine with more weapons. And so far, the West isn't being deterred. Yeah, they'd have to understand there's no winners in nuclear warfare. You know, there's been some reporting out there, or at least speculation, about Putin's health. You, uh, you wrote the book, Putin's World. It's a book I'm currently reading. You have a keen understanding of Vladimir Putin as much as anyone else can, I would think. So what, what, what do we know about him? Do you think he's sick or do you think this is all speculation? Well, there's a lot of speculation looking at the way his face looks. Uh, a couple of days ago, he was gripping on a table when he met with someone. But I don't think we should get too excited about this either. He may or may not have health problems. Uh, but, you know, he appeared today. He met with the UN Secretary General, Guterres. Uh, he's been meeting with other people in the last few days. Uh, so if he is sick, he probably has it under control. Um, and, he, you know, he... He doesn't look as ill as maybe some people are speculating. You know, here on Top Story, we've covered the U.S. deciding not to sanction his girlfriend, Alina Kabaeva, but his daughters have been sanctioned. Does Putin care about this? I'm sure he cares somewhat that his daughters are sanctioned, but one has to assume that before the war broke out, uh, since Russia has been sanctioned before, they probably made some kind of arrangements. We don't know where and how all of his money is handled. Uh, so he may not like it, but probably the impact isn't maybe as devastating as people might think, given the way that these people know, you know, how to, to obscure where their riches are. You know, um, his latest claim is that the West is trying to destroy Russia from within and that he's calling on his prosecutors to be tough on fake news. Does the U.N. chief have any hopes of a breakthrough with Putin at this point going over there and speaking with him? Well, apparently they agreed that the Red Cross could go in and there would be humanitarian co corridors. That's what they agreed to verbally. But the issue with Russia and everything that Putin has said in the past two months since the war began is, uh, don't listen to what they say, look at what they do. Will they really allow the Red Cross to come in there and allow, for instance, in besieged Mariupol, as you just showed, will they allow those people, uh, and, there, and there are many of them still um, in the bowels of that uh, steel factory, will they allow them to come out and then not shoot on them? So it didn't sound from what uh, Mr. Guterres said when he left that he was that optimistic, uh, but at least he's tried. You know, both Ukraine and Russia have learned so much. At, at the onset of this, Ukraine, so many in Ukraine did not believe that Putin and Russia would invade. Putin maybe thought that they would be able to take this country easy. They were wrong. He was wrong. What do you think happens next year? How does this end, knowing Vladimir Putin like you do? Well, at the moment, I think the Russians are determined to try and take the whole of the Donbass region uh, in the southeast, as, as you showed in your report. But there are some people who think that they won't even be able to do that. Uh, because their army has performed so badly and the Ukrainians have performed so well. Now, if they were able to take that territory, then they might at least settle for a ceasefire and some temporary truce uh, and, and allow their own military and the Ukrainians to regroup. Um, on the other hand, they might push forward more. Uh, they might take more territory. They might try and take the major port of Odessa and therefore cut Ukraine off completely from the Black Sea and leave it as a landlocked country. That, of course, would be devastating for Ukraine. Uh, but the Ukrainians, of course, are determined to fight back and ensure that that doesn't happen. Um, is is Putin no way, somebody, yeah. Angela, I'm, I'm sorry to, to stop you, but is no, no, Putin no. somebody who could accept defeat if that does happen? 
Well, I think it would be very hard for him to uh, accept defeat, but he doesn't have to tell the Russian people that he's been defeated. Whatever happens, he can portray that as a victory. Uh, but no, he, it would be very difficult for him to accept retreat. And that's why most people think that this war is going to go on for a long time. Even if the Russians don't win immediately, uh, they will stop, they will regroup, but they won't give up their aim of really subjugating Ukraine to Russia's will. Angela Stent, we love having you on Top Story. Your book is excellent, and we will be having you back on very soon. Thank you so much for that, Angela. Next tonight to a late-breaking headline here at home, a shocking new government report just released after six workers were killed by a tornado strike at an Amazon warehouse in December. Investigators discovering employees took shelter in the wrong place and that a megaphone meant to warn people of danger was locked in a cage. NBC Shaq Brewster has more. Tonight, new government findings alleging a series of safety risks at the Amazon factory in Edwardsville, Illinois, when a deadly tornado struck the plant, killing six workers. I'd say about half of the building is destroyed. The report by OSHA found chaotic circumstances and communication breakdowns that may have led to the loss of life. The government agency sending a two-page letter to Amazon saying some employees were unaware that the northern bathroom was a tornado shelter. They took cover in a restroom on the southern end of the building. As the tornado hit, that southern half collapsed. Five people died there. In the days after the tragedy, an Amazon spokesperson telling NBC's Morgan Chesky that managers went around the factory to warn employees to take cover. And our leaders on the site really immediately began to shelter people in place and getting people to move into the sheltered areas. But the OSHA report said a megaphone kept to warn employees to take shelter was locked in a cage and not accessible. Managers had to walk through the warehouse and tell people to take cover one by one. Still, the federal report found the company's severe weather policies met minimal guidelines for storm sheltering and did not issue any fines or citations. While Amazon is not required to respond to the letter, an OSHA official said, quote, six workers died in this event, so that by itself should be a wake-up call for employers. Amazon released a statement to NBC News saying in part, OSHA's investigation did not find any violations of causes for citation, but we're constantly looking to innovate and improve our safety measures and have already begun conducting additional safety and emergency preparedness drills. All right, Shaq joins us live now on this breaking story. Shaq, you know, it, it's sort of confusing. People may be watching the story going, six people died. There clearly were mistakes that OSHA highlighted there, but they're not citing them yeah. for any fines or, or violations, and we know that there's three lawsuits, at least three lawsuits still pending uh, with civil cases. That's right. Although there are no penalties coming from the federal government, this is far from over. You mentioned there are three lawsuits that have already been filed. Two of them are representing two of the workers who were actually killed at that factory. Another one's representing some other workers that were there at the scene and said they suffered some harm. And beyond the lawsuits, you also have what was stated in the letter. And OSHA ended their letter by saying, although it's not required, they are expecting, they are encouraging Amazon and those other contractors involved to report back on what changes they have made. And you saw that statement from Amazon saying they are continuously making changes to their safety procedures. Shaq Brewster with some new reporting on this for us. Shaq, we thank you for that. To Silicon Valley now with Elon Musk about to own Twitter. Conflicting signals today about what it may mean for users on the platform, the changes they might see, and Twitter's accountability. Jolene Kent has more. Tonight, Elon Musk's potential Twitter takeover is causing shockwaves. A super user himself, Musk is taking the company private, raising serious questions about its future. He doesn't have to deal with investors. You won't see any numbers anymore. You won't see any information. Uh, they don't have to disclose much. Musk would have the ability to change and control Twitter, one of the favorite platforms of some of the most influential people in the world. It's very important for uh, there to be an inclusive arena for free speech. Republican Congresswoman Marsha Blackburn cheering the takeover as an encouraging day for free speech, while Democratic Senator Elizabeth Warren called it dangerous for our democracy. Today, Musk tweeting, the extreme antibody reaction from those who fear free speech says it all.
But Musk faces unique pressures. He also runs SpaceX and Tesla. That stock sinking 12% just today. With his priorities, can Elon make it a better, more successful business? When you're, you're doing all these incredibly difficult things, you know, he lands rockets in platforms in the middle of the ocean. He, he's good at no. challenges. He created, he single-handedly moved forward the electric car industry. Everybody else has been chasing him. Musk's passion for Twitter has earned him the support of Twitter co-founder and fellow billionaire Jack Dorsey. The ex-CEO tweeting, Elon is the singular solution I trust, adding, this is the right path. I believe it with all my heart. The open question now is whether users will feel the same. Yeah, we're going to have to wait and see how Musk puts his sort of touch on Twitter. Joe Lincoln joins us now from Los Angeles. So, Joe, a lot of people who own Twitter stock are going to be making money off this. What's the average amount people are going to walk away with? Yeah, the premium that people will make is 38% off of the April 1st stock price. That's when Elon Musk first indicated that he owned about 9% of Twitter. But we also have to remember people are losing money on this deal as well. Tesla stock today tanked 12%. It wiped out about $125 billion worth of value over at Tesla. So this push and pull, this tug of war continues, Tom. Joe Ling Ken for us tonight. Joe, we thank you for that. And Musk's Twitter takeover, catching the eye of another billionaire, Jeff Bezos, the Amazon co-founder, taking a swipe at Musk, suggesting in a Twitter thread that the purchase may be giving China influence over the company, hinting at the Tesla CEO's business ties to the country. Bezos tweeting, did the Chinese government just gain a bit of leverage over the town square? Adding later, my own answer to this question is probably not. The more likely outcome in this regard is complexity in China for Tesla rather than and censorship at Twitter, followed by, but we'll see. Musk is extremely good at navigating this kind of complexity. For more on Musk and this seeming to be hazing treatment from Jeff Bezos, I want to bring in CNBC's senior media and tech correspondent, Julia Borson. Julia, thanks so much for joining Top Story. So I got to ask you, what do you think's behind Bezos and why do you think he sort of went after Musk in these tweets? I mean, he dialed it back, but it was no doubt interesting. Well, look, we have to remember that Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, they have a lot in common. They both are among the wealthiest men in the world. They both also own their private space companies that are in direct competition with each other. And Jeff Bezos has been subject to plenty of scrutiny, particularly regulatory scrutiny around his company. And I think what he's doing here is trying to point out, hey, guys, Amazon's not the only company that the regulator should be taking a close eye to. And this maybe you guys should have some scrutiny of my rival, uh, Elon Musk, over there. So I think that this is part friendly rivalry and part just frustration with the fact that Amazon has drawn so much um, attention from, from the regulators in Washington. Julie, you know, this really starts an interesting conversation because I don't know if we've heard enough if buying Twitter is going to make life for Elon Musk more difficult. And what do I mean by that? Well, as we've said before, he, he runs Tesla. He runs SpaceX. Sometimes he can be very, I don't know, sensitive to criticism around his companies. But he's also trying to promote free speech. So being the head of Twitter now sort of puts him in this pickle. Well, look, I would say buying Twitter is go definitely going to make his life more difficult, more complicated. Not only is he uh, raising questions about what's going on with Tesla, you know, Tesla in China um, has a, Tesla has a very close relationship with China in that it is reliant on Chinese manufacturers of batteries, but also China is a major market for Tesla. So you have Elon Musk doing that. And on the other hand, Twitter is banned in China. So a lot of complexity here, as you put it originally, and a lot of questions about how he's going to be juggling all of these different jobs and all of these different businesses. Yeah, Twitter quite different from his other ventures, but we're going to have to wait and see. Finally, we spoke a little bit about this with Joe, but some people are going to be very, very rich off this deal, including someone who endorsed Musk purchasing Twitter, Jack Dorsey, the founder of Twitter. How much is he set to make on this deal? Look, Jack Dorsey will profit handsomely, but what's interesting here is that he's not going to profit as much as some of the founders of other social media companies. Jack Dorsey did not have voting control over Twitter, and he was effectively pushed out as CEO in November of last year when Parag Agarwal took over as CEO. And, and Dorsey did have a challenge in that he battled with activist investor Elliott Management. But one thing that's really interesting right now is that Dorsey is really supporting Musk, supporting 
supporting Musk's interest in totally transforming Twitter's business model. But what Dorsey is endorsing is a reversal of a lot of the things that he did when he was at the company. So a complicated uh, perspective and kind of unexpected take and approach from a guy who founded this company, didn't control it, and then now is making a lot of money from Musk buying the company. CNBC's Julia Borson. Julia, we thank you for that. We take you now to the Supreme Court, where the Biden administration defended its plan to end one of the Trump administration's signature immigration efforts, remain in Mexico, which required asylum seekers to stay in that country while they wait for a hearing in U.S. courts. Here's NBC's justice correspondent Pete Williams with today's argument before the high court. President Trump called it the Migrant Protection Protocol, requiring immigrants from Central America seeking asylum to wait just outside the U.S. More than 68,000 were shuttled back to Mexico. Tent cities sprang up along the border. Human rights groups said hundreds were kidnapped and assaulted. In one of his first actions after taking office, President Biden shut it down. But Texas and Missouri sued, saying the Trump program helped stem the surge at the border and claiming the government didn't follow the law in shutting it down, so a judge ordered it started back up. The government says Congress has never provided money for enough detention space at the border, so thousands of immigrants can be allowed to wait inside the U.S., evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. At the Supreme Court today, Justice Samuel Alito said that's probably no more rigorous than screening baseball fans entering Nationals Park. You got a little checklist and you're going, and you know, boom, 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 and that's how you can process. Maybe you're right, but that's, that's what you think Congress meant by a case-by-case -case determination. But several justices noted that the Trump program requires the agreement of Mexico, even though the lawyer for Texas told the court that no negotiating was required. What do you mean it doesn't require negotiation with the foreign power? What are we supposed to do, just drive truckloads of people into Mexico and leave them without negotiating with Mexico? All right, Pete joins us now from Washington. Pete, so many around the country and really, frankly, even across the border are going to be watching this decision, including a lot of lawmakers. Did you get a feeling of where the court might be landing? I did. Even though this is a conservative court, I got the feeling that they were hinting that they might let the Biden administration shut this program down. And I think the key to it all is what Brett Kavanaugh said today. He said there is a phrase in the law that says the government can do what the Biden administration wants to do because it would be a substantial public benefit. And I think that may be the avenue that the court takes to allow the Biden administration to do this when it rules on the case in late June. But of course, by then, this all may be eclipsed by the COVID policy question, which is just now beginning to heat up in the courts, Tom. And we're all going to be watching that one as well. All right, Pete, we thank you for that. Now to the mountain of evidence released from that deadly shooting on the set of Rust. We showed you some of it yesterday. Hours of footage painting a picture of that chaos that ensued after the tragic accident. NBC's Maggie Vespa has that story. Authorities releasing a mountain of evidence from the moments after the fatal shooting of Rust cinematographer Helena Hutchins. A close examination of the hours of body cam video has revealed new details in the chaos that followed the tragic accident. She came in here and went across her chest. Wounded alongside her, director Joel Souza. Outside, the film's armorer frantically searches for the box the bullet came from. Sorry. You're okay. Sorry. Just relax. Just relax. I'm so scared. I'm sorry. You're all right. Just relax. <laughs> so here's the box that I got. Okay. A live round fired, authorities say, by a despondent Alec Baldwin. Baldwin has denied pulling the trigger. I was the one holding the gun, yeah. The actor later telling investigators he thought the revolver was cold, meaning unloaded. There's supposed to be nothing in there. A stunning revelation in a trove of evidence released by investigators this week, six months after the deadly shooting on that New Mexico ranch. It includes a clip of Baldwin during rehearsal pulling his revolver, moments before deputies say he fired the fatal shot. And raw exchanges with that armorer, Hannah Gutierrez Reed. I'm the armorer, or at least I was. Gutierrez Reed telling investigators she's been working as an armorer for nine months, one month on rust. After a female detective walks her to the restroom, you hear the 24 year old complain about damage done to her career. How old are you? 24. I'm like the only female armorer in the game, and I just up my whole entire career. My dad's the best, one of the best armors in the entire world, and he trained me, and I'm a 
failure. Investigators also collected emails crew members sent before the shooting, raising serious safety concerns, and text messages from Gutierrez Reed to a supplier. In them, she asks for live ammunition for a different film. Live ammo is never allowed on set. The supplier replies, it's a serious mistake, always ends in tears. Gutierrez Reed has not responded to NBC's request for comment today, but has previously denied any wrongdoing. This morning on the Today Show, the Santa Fe County Sheriff was clear the investigation into what happened on that set remains ongoing. I don't think anybody's off the hook when it comes to criminal charges. Months later, the major question looming over Rust's unscripted tragedy. All right, Maggie joins us now from Los Angeles. Maggie, representatives from both Alec Baldwin and Helena Hutchins' husband, Matt, have issued statements after this footage was released. What do they have to say and what can we expect moving forward in this investigation? Sure, Tom, we'll start there. Investigators are waiting on a few pieces of evidence, including forensics on firearms and ammunition, and the sheriff noting a decision on charges will be up to the district attorney. As to those statements you mentioned, Alec Baldwin's lawyers say Baldwin believes the evidence shows he, their words, acted responsibly, and attorneys for Matt Hutchins simply said he's surprised this evidence was released amid an ongoing investigation. Tom. All right, Maggie Vespa, we thank you for that, and welcome to Top Story, making her debut tonight. All right, still ahead tonight, the Little League shooting scare. Players and coaches sent running for cover when shots rang out in the middle of a baseball game. One of the middle schoolers' mothers talking to Top Story about the horrifying ordeal. Plus, the father charged after his daughter brought marijuana gummies to school, how the edibles ended up in his daughter's lunch. And inside the rollover, disturbing video showing students flying after a speeding car crashed into their school bus what the driver saw just moments before the accident. Stay with us. We're back now with a chilling moment caught on camera in South Carolina. Shots ringing out at a youth baseball game. Our Zinclay SMWA talked to one family that witnessed the horrifying incident. It started as a peaceful youth baseball game, but ended in panic. A flurry of gunshots near a South Carolina baseball field. Players, just young children, looking around, confused by the noise. The cheers of parents turning to panic screams as kids and coaches ducked for their lives Monday. I just heard two booms and I thought that it was fireworks, poppers. Two seconds later, it was just like an automatic. Were you scared? Uh, yeah, I was shaking. Mother Lori Ferguson was there. Her son Silas standing on the mound just moments before shots rang out from the parking lot near Pepper Hill Park in North Charleston. What did you think was happening? At first, when I heard boom boom, I, I looked up because I thought it was fireworks. Every, like, everybody looked up. And then, like, and then I, at the second I heard my coach say, get down, get down, so I get down. Video filmed by Lori's husband shows several groups of children playing on the popular field when suddenly dozens of gunshots ring out for nearly 30 seconds. Parents telling kids on the wide open baseball field to crawl for safety. Luckily, no players or parents were injured. Police now offering a $10,000 reward for information as the shooters remain at large. We've never had anything like this before. Is this something you ever expected to happen at this location at a baseball field where families gather? A hundred percent no. You just never think you would, you personally, me, would live through anything like that. But today, gun violence is a reality more families are living through. A research letter published in the New England Journal of Medicine shows gun violence as the leading cause of youth deaths in the U.S. as of 2020. A reality playing out on U.S. streets this weekend. On Saturday, five teenagers were shot in downtown Atlanta, ages 15 to 19. Police saying all five remain in stable condition. And in St. Louis, a mother mourns the death of her daughter and nephew. Oh God, oh God, oh God. According to police, the 12 and 14 year old died last month playing with a gun that fired while streaming on Instagram Live. Back in Charleston, families shocked but persevering. I know you said you were shaking after it happened. Do you feel comfortable playing again? Yeah. We're literally at the baseball field every single day. This could have happened anywhere. 
All right, Zinc Clay joins us now live. Zinc Clay, this is just so wild, and, and you feel for those, those little kids because they were just trying to play a sport and have a good time. Any idea how close police are to maybe finding the, the people responsible for that shooting? Yeah, Tom. So it is incredibly disturbing, especially to see these children respond in real time to gunfire. But earlier today, police said that an officer did, in fact, respond to the gunfire in less than a minute. But they say when he arrived, he did not see anyone involved. But cars were struck. And so far, they found three firearms in the area, but no suspects have been arrested. But what's interesting, Tom, is that Lori, the mother I spoke with, says she does not think more police at the baseball field is the answer. And the community overall has has very different views on just what needs to be done. The mayor says they need to get illegal guns off the street. And now authorities have canceled games at that park, at least for now. But Lori, that mother, tells me she does not want her kids to be scared, even with the very real dangers. They're going to keep playing ball, Tom. Okay, Zinclair, we thank you for that. Now to some new and uh, more horrifying video out of New Mexico this time, capturing the moment when a speeding car T-boned a school bus, sending students flying. We want to warn you, this video is graphic. Isa Gutierrez has more. Tonight, new video shows a horrific moment inside a school bus full of children in New Mexico. When a car crashes into the side of the bus, the sudden impact sending the middle schoolers flying into the air. Screams can be heard as the bus flips on its side. The body camera video released by the Albuquerque Police Department and obtained by our affiliate KOB also shows the moments after the terrifying accident. Listen to the kids' chilling words. According to a press release from police, there were 23 students riding the bus at the time of the crash in February. Several of them were sent to the hospital with injuries, but remarkably, everyone survived. They were racing. The bus driver spoke to police after the accident, telling them he saw the car coming but couldn't do anything to stop it. So there were two uh, white cars and the, the Mustang that they're all damaged. They were speeding on each lane, and uh, the guy didn't have nowhere to go. But when I was across, he just. This guy was beating him, so he just went straight into me. Another body camera video captured police interviewing a witness. So you said you saw the white Mustang and the blue Mustang racing, is that correct? Oh, yes, at a high rate of speed. Police say the white Mustang was going 65 to 80 miles per hour when it struck the school bus. They identified the driver as 49-year-old Mario Perez. Here he is, lying in a hospital bed after the accident. I'm not going anywhere. No, I'm not going anywhere. I can't even walk. According to police documents, Perez was charged with two counts of great bodily harm by vehicle, a third-degree felony. Court documents obtained by NBC News cite a history of speeding that has, quote, escalated over the years, according to prosecutors, from speeding tickets to allegedly drag racing. A judge released him from jail earlier this month on this case pending trial. And you're not to drive while this case is pending. Any questions about that? No, ma'am, not at all. Efforts to reach Perez for comment were unsuccessful. This devastating crash as motor vehicle deaths are on the rise across the country. Data from the U.S. Department of Transportation estimating more than 20,000 people died in motor vehicle crashes in the first half of 2021. That's up 18 percent over the previous year and the largest number since 2006. Incidents of speeding and traveling without a seatbelt also higher than before the pandemic. Police telling NBC News Tuesday, a second driver possibly involved in the school bus accident has not been charged. All right, Issa joins us now live in studio. So, Issa, it's good that all those kids survived. Do we know how they're doing tonight? Tom, these were some serious, serious injuries. So two of those students that went to the hospital sustained uh, serious injuries to their legs. One of them had to undergo surgery. Uh, another student also had to uh, have surgery for a serious pelvic fracture. So it's really amazing. I mean, especially after seeing that video that they survived. And you they're you okay. can't believe that they're all OK. And then finally, I know you spoke with the public defender who's representing the driver of that white Mustang who T-boned the school bus. What, what are they saying? That's right. Just moments before coming on, uh, he told us that that video of the car crashing into the bus does not tell the complete story and that we should let the court process play out as it's intended to. Okay. And he's expected to be arraigned on Friday, so we're going to get some updates later okay. this week. Issa, we thank you for that. Still to come, the baby found safe. The new developments in a case California police are calling a parent's worst nightmare. You may have heard about this story. We have a big update. Stay with us.
All right, uh, we are back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin in Washington, and Vice President Kamala Harris testing positive for COVID today. Harris saying she doesn't have any symptoms and will isolate according to CDC guidelines. The White House says the vice president has not been in close contact with President Biden since the White House Easter egg roll last Monday. All right, police in Ohio say a 10-year-old girl who brought cannabis gummies to school and shared them with friends thought they were leftover Easter candy. The girl's father now facing misdemeanor charges. According to court documents, he said he used the gummies for a medical condition. The five kids who ate them last Friday were taken to a local hospital after experiencing nausea, hallucinations, and elevated heart rates. All right, next to the kidnapped three-month-old in California that was found alive today. Brandon Cuellar was allegedly kidnapped from his family's apartment Monday when his grandmother was unloading groceries from her car. Police released this video. It's chilling, showing a suspect walking down a street with a baby carrier. Officials say that man was one of three people taken into custody. Baby Brandon was taken to a local hospital as a precaution, but we're, we hear he's okay. And Sony Pictures announcing rapper Bad Bunny has been cast as Marvel's newest hero. The Grammy Award-winning artist is set to play El Muerto, a wrestler who gets his powers from a mask passed down through his family. He will be the first ever Latino actor to headline a live-action Marvel movie. All right, tonight the family of a Missouri teenager who died after sliding off an amusement park ride in Orlando is demanding answers as to how a 14-year-old boy could fall right out of his seat at a 400-foot high amusement ride in Orlando. The wrong, wrongful death lawsuit igniting new questions about what went wrong and why. NBC Sam Brock brings us that story. Tyree Sampson's mom called him her personal teddy bear and gentle giant who left for spring break in late March never to return. I couldn't hug him. I couldn't do anything. I, I, I don't wish that on any parent, any parent. Uh, my son was Tyree Sams. He was 14 years old. He's been taken away from me. The depth of pain for mother and father now transformed into legal action. After their son died riding the recently opened 400-foot Orlando freefall ride, coming right out of his seat, the pair jointly filing a wrongful death lawsuit, which names Icon Park, the manufacturer, and the ride owner Slingshot, claiming system-wide failure, alleging the operator negligently adjusted restraint systems on the freefall ride, failing to train their employees, and failing to provide a safe amusement park ride. This tragedy could have absolutely been avoided very simply with one thing, with this $22 seatbelt. If it had been employed as a secondary restraint. Icon Park, where the ride is located, has declined to comment on the lawsuit, and the manufacturer couldn't be reached. But an attorney for Slingshot, which owns and operates the ride, told NBC News in part, Orlando Slingshot continues to fully cooperate with the state during its investigation. We reiterate that all protocols, procedures, and safety measures provided by the manufacturer of the ride were followed. Samson, a promising football player, weighed almost 100 pounds more than the manufacturer's weight limit per his family. They had a full-size metal detector like we see at the airport, but no scale. Today, Samson's father, emotional, visiting the site for the first time. The reason I'm here is to get some understanding and get a few answers. All right, Sam joins us tonight from Coral Gables. Sam, we know you have some new information about Samson's seat on that ride, the slingshot, and what was revealed by the family's attorney. What can you tell us? So in the engineer's report that was released last week, Tom, they specified there was supposed to be about a three-inch gap between the harness and the seat. After a manual adjustment on Samson's seat, it ended up six to seven inches, according to that report. But the attorney for the family today said it was actually 10 to 11 inches wide, ultimately, which is the gap that he fell through. And again, we're talking about a 380-pound person. The weight limit for this ride was 287 pounds. That attorney talking about the fact that there was a metal detector on site to make sure that if if your phone or keys fell out, it wouldn't hit someone, but no scale to weigh a person that did not fit inside of the seat. And this is the outcome that happened. And Sam, you know, it's completely understandable that Tyree Sampson's parents want more safety on rides. How long would it realistically take to change certain regulations out there? So here's the problem. We know it's going to be months of uncovering documents in court to even really pin down what the shortcomings are. But as far as a legislative solution, and this is where the rubber meets the road, states create their own rules when it comes to amusement park safety regulations. There is no uniform code. There used to be from Congress, but that was taken away back in the 70s. What these families would like to see is a federal uniform policy so this does not happen to any other kids or any other families that have to go through this level of anguish ever again, Tom.
All right, Sam Brock for us. Sam, thank you for that. Time now for Top Stories Global Watch and an explosion ripping through a van at a university campus in Pakistan. Officials there saying the blast killed three Chinese nationals and their driver. It happened at the University of Karachi Tuesday. The Chinese nationals killed workers at the school's Confucius Institute. Police believe a suicide bomber was behind that attack. Next to North Korea, where Kim Jong-un says he's going to speed up the development of his country's nuclear arsenal. He made those comments at this huge military parade. You can see in this video from state media that part of that parade included a display of what appears to be a nuclear-capable missile. Last month, Pyongyang test-launched one of those types of missiles, sparking international condemnation. All right, we want to head to Beijing now, where concerns over another COVID lockdown are growing. People there stockpiling food and supplies, fearful of entering a similar lockdown to the current one in effect in Shanghai as cases begin to rise. Janice Mackey Freyer joins us now from Beijing. Janice, so how are people preparing there? How would you describe the situation right now in Beijing? Well, the anxiety about a possible lockdown has been brewing for weeks now since Shanghai went into lockdown and there were shortages of food, of medicine, of other basic needs. Uh, and that desperation uh, really resonated with people here. Uh, lockdowns in China are uh, the full thing. You can't leave your home. They are very strictly enforced. Um, so with that possibility, uh, people saw the need to prepare. And then last weekend, when a Authorities announced in China, in Beijing's biggest district, the one we're in right now, that there would be mass testing. That was the cue for people to prepare. They were rushing to grocery stores. There were huge lineups. Store shelves were being emptied. They were being replenished again. Uh, the government has been very adamant in its messaging through state media that the city does have enough food. But there is the growing worry here uh, that a lockdown could be coming. Have you noticed, I mean, you live there, have you noticed anything very hard to get lately? I've been stocking up for a few weeks, <laughs> I'll confess, and uh, I was among those people at the beginning of the week um, trying to get a little bit extra of everything. Um, the government has been releasing all of these statistics on how many tons of vegetables they have in warehouses, how much rice is available. They are trying to ease some of the concerns. But what happened with the Shanghai lockdown, Tom, is that people realized that it could happen anywhere. If it could happen in Shanghai, it could happen at any time, and it could happen with very little notice. Uh, we're still in the stage here where we're talking about if, uh, dozens of cases that are being discovered, whereas now in Shanghai, they're still adding 15 to 20,000 cases a day. Uh, but that's how it started in Shanghai. So the sense among people here is that there's still the very real possibility, even if the numbers don't start to climb. Do you, do you have any sense what that tip? point is, I mean, because the scenes out of Shanghai are, are incredibly desperate. I mean, it, it is a cruel lockdown, and I'm sure no one anywhere would want to live that way. So do you have any idea what the tipping point is there in Beijing? Uh, that's really hard to gauge because... In Shanghai a month ago, when there were dozens of cases being announced, the authorities were saying there's no lockdown uh, that's being planned. And then days after, they said that publicly, there was a lockdown announced in Shanghai. It started as four days in half of the city, four days in the other half of the city. Now, 25 million people citywide, businesses paralyzed, global supply chains impacted. It's in its fourth week now, and there's still no real end in sight. All right, Janice Mackey Freyer for us tonight. We thank you for that. Turning back now to Ukraine, where the Russian invasion has made a hero out of one Jack Russell Terrier, the tiny but mighty bomb sniffing pup working every day to expose Russian explosives. NBC's Aaron McLaughlin takes us to Cherniv with that story. His name is Patron, or Bullet, but in Ukraine, he's known as a hero. The pint-sized Jack Russell Terrier specially trained to sniff out landmines left behind by the Russians. Every day he's working, his owner Mihailo says. We met Patron on the outskirts of the northern city of Chernihiv, where they're clearing the area of the remnants of war. Ukrainian forces may have pushed the Russians out, but what the occupation left behind is potentially just as deadly. Unexploded ordinances and mines, too many to count. Patron helps collect them before detonation. How many lives has he saved? 
It's impossible to know, he says. One mine can kill one person or several people. We're told the number of mines he's discovered is a secret. Mihailo says he purchased Patron two years ago as a gift for his son. I took him with me to work one day, he says. He showed his skills. It was an accident. Now Patron is famous, with over 100,000 followers on Instagram, posts showing him hard at work or at play with his trusty stick. He's also known for comforting other emergency service workers who might be having a bad day. But sometimes, all the attention can be too much. <laughs> Nothing a few treats can't fix before he returns to potentially save more lives on the front lines. Aaron McLaughlin, NBC News, Cherniev, Ukraine. All right, when we come back, the new way to invest your 401k, the major retirement plan now accepting Bitcoin. The risks you need to know about to keep your money safe. Safe, stay with us. All right, back now with Money Talks and the announcement that could change how you save for retirement. The Wall Street Journal reporting Fidelity Investments is saying it will allow investors to put Bitcoin in their 401ks. The option expected to be available to millions of U.S. workers in just a few months. For more on what you need to know about your investments, I want to bring in Caleb Silver. He's the editor-in-chief at Investopedia. Caleb, thanks for joining Top Story tonight. So explain this to our viewers. This is a very big deal. This is not some small bank in the Cayman Islands. This is Fidelity, one of the largest asset managers with four trillion in assets under management allowing 23,000 of its retirement plan companies to use Bitcoin and put Bitcoin into the 401ks of their sponsors of their companies so this is a very interesting move towards the end of the year they're gonna be able to allocate as much as 20% of their portfolio towards Bitcoin what do you think about this I mean so many investors are new to Bitcoin it's a little hard to understand what's your take well Bitcoin is a risky asset by definition super volatile but the cats out of the bag the horses left the barn pick your analogy 80 million Americans or so own some form of cryptocurrency, and now it's become a real asset that folks want to pass on through their estates. They want to use it to accumulate wealth over time. So you can't ignore the returns on Bitcoin, but you have to pay attention to the volatility because it's very unpredictable. And is it your understanding that it's going to be pretty easy to select? I mean, sometimes with your 401k, Fidelity gives you so many options on what you want to get into. You think it's going to be easy as a click of a button and you can start investing into something like Bitcoin? Yeah, it's going to be Bitcoin or some Bitcoin related investment like an exchange traded fund. But they're saying it's going to be Bitcoin. We're going to see how that goes because right now there's no prime broker for Bitcoin. So if something goes wrong, who do you turn to? Well, in this case, you turn to Fidelity. They know it's risky, but Fidelity's not new to this. They've been mining their own Bitcoin since 2015. It's very unusual that they're rolling this out now. And there's a lot of regulation coming this Way too. Yeah, one of the friends uh, of this broadcast is Michelle Singletary. She's a writer for the Washington Post. She gives personal finance advice. And she had this quote uh, recently about, about cryptocurrencies and 401k. And she says, it's everything. And she was quoting John, John Oliver's take on crypto. She says, it's everything you don't understand about money combined with everything you don't understand about computers. So, I mean, it is complicated. It is volatile. Do you agree with that stance that people should, should avoid it? Absolutely. What could go wrong? Have you ever tried to explain big Bitcoin to your mom. My mom kicked me out of the house the other day when I tried to explain it to her. It's a complicated asset and it doesn't really have any underlying fundamentals. So when the bottom drops out of it or it rockets up 25, 30 percent, you really don't know why. You just got to hold on for dear life. That said, it's returned about a million percent over the past decade. So there's real money in Bitcoin and a lot of investors are involved with it. Now Fidelity opening the door to 401k participants. Yeah, you definitely cannot deny those returns. All right, Caleb Silver from Investopedia. Caleb, great having you on Top Story tonight. Thank you so much for that. Still ahead, a Texas student reaching a major milestone he didn't know was possible. Stay with us. Finally tonight, one Texas teen didn't think attending college was in his future plans, but thanks to a new inclusive education program, that senior will soon be headed to class. His message, if I can do it, you can do it. For Texas senior Jalen Walker, his high school career is quickly coming to a close. To my mom, to my coach, to my family, I love y'all. Jalen is the Summit High School basketball team student manager. Come on. But Jalen didn't always have a plan for what was next after high school. He was born prematurely and with a learning disability. His parents didn't think college was an option until they saw this story on our NBC station in Dallas, highlighting a new program for students with intellectual disabilities. 
Ayala is among the first to apply for a new program starting in the fall at the University of North Texas called Elevar. And I saw that story and I was like, oh my gosh, this is for Jalen. The family visited the University of North Texas campus last summer to learn about the program. So Jalen is a perfect example uh, to be able to say, you know, he can do it and everybody else can do it as well, right? And then last week, a letter from the University of North Texas arrived at the Walker household. Congratulations, you have been selected to be part of the Mean Green family. Yes! yes you did it! You did it! And now his school and his family is celebrating his next steps. To get accepted in the LMR program, the UNT, is, it's amazing. And we, we couldn't be more happy. Jalen hopes his story will help others to be more inclusive of people like him. I want to help who have learned disability. You can do anything you want to do. If I can do it, you can do it. And congrats to Jalen. We wish him luck next fall at UNT. We also want to thank our Dallas-Fort Worth station as well for help on that story. And we thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.